into something just bear with me i know your mind is gonna explode right now my mind it definitely exploded so, um you will see here in the middle there is d1 so what happens is in vedic astrology there are division charts there are actually many division charts um it's like taking each house and going deep into the brain surgery basically opening that house and seeing what was inside of that house just that house itself at the moment of the person's birth and you will see that the houses are going to change they're not going to be the same anymore uh, now this is very complicated and I'll be honest I do not know much about division charts uh, this is something that a professional astrologer is going to look into but they are very good if you want to know a particular thing if you're just interested in particular thing if you are talking to a professional astrologer you will see that for example when they are doing the kundli matching that we talked about previously they will also look at the navamsha chart which is I believe the D9, which is the house of your spouse, your partnership, and all that kind of stuff, they will match the Navamsha charts of the groom and the bride. They will also look at the D10, which is the Dasamsha chart. Um, this is the chart that represents your 10th house and your career. If you are going to book a reading with a professional astrologer about your career, most likely the astrologer is going to open your 10th house and look uh, on the tiny nerves under that surgery uh, time for all these planets and what they were doing and how they were behaving at the time of your birth basically to know as much detail as possible about your career options and also you'll be more knowledgeable so next time if you want to uh, speak to an astrologer professional astrologer just ask them if they're going to do a reading of your uh, dashamsha or a subtamsha chart now let's talk about the practicality of the chart and how you can actually <clears throat> read it what kind of information you can get from it obviously you can get any sort of information from it one thing that i can tell you is that i've seen many times and i think that based on what i have experienced it works if you are having a friend or a potential lover soulmate whatever what you can do is that you can look at the position of your moon so for example if we look at uh, albert einstein his position uh his moon is positioned in the sixth house now, if you have a friend and that person has moon in the 8th house, remember we're going um, backwards anticlockwise. So his moon would be one, two, three positions from mine. That means that he would understand me on a soul level, like what I'm trying to convey, what I'm, who I really am innately quite well. But my position of the moon, if it's in the 8th house, needs to travel all around to understand him. So he would have much easier time understanding me than I would have understanding him. Now, obviously the best two positions that I can think of if you're thinking about two people is that either they're just across each other, looking at each other basically. So let's say if his moon is in the sixth house, my moon would have to be in the 12th house. Then we are just on the same level. Or the best position would be if we both have moon in the same house, then we really truly understand each other on a soul level then we're talking about someone who we can call a soulmate people sometimes ask if you can um foresee somebody's death and in a way yes if you dig in deep you might be able to predict that but i think no astrologer will give you that answer because it will go against anything ethical obviously and also it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy obviously so for that reason um i don't think any good astrologer is going to answer that question sometimes it's good to not be as curious because like i said it can kind of mess with you i know for a fact that when i was going through my spiritual awakening and i have had a, an astrologer do, an astrologer do a reading for me and they said something about my parents that there could be an injury or something i really didn't like that i didn't like that because now everybody is different some people might like that because they might feel it might give them a wake-up call like okay i'm not treating my parents right and if this thing happens i need to make sure that i'm treating them right for me i didn't like that personally because i, I do know that i'm a powerful manifester and i didn't want that lingering in my mind whatsoever 
So certain things we should just let go with the flow. But of course, if you're if you're confused about your life purpose and so on, those things you can easily find in your chart. You can look at the position of Jupiter and look if it's blessed and if it's going to give you a lot of money and wealth. Venus also is known for for a planet that gives a lot of money. Obviously, uh, the the usual. There's a lot of funny content out there on, on um, social network. You know, women always ask the guys about, you know, what, when, when were you born? And the guys are already like, oh my God, I know what she's gonna do. Because you can read a lot of stuff about the other person, obviously, from their chart. Like if they have Rahu in the first place, you know that they are very um, self-righteous and they're self-centered. Um, but also they're, they're they, uh, People with Rahu in the first house, they have very peculiar kind of character, different from, from anybody else. Um, if they have Libra in the first house, they're kind of people that want to be liked by everybody. And so on and so forth. And, and you will see all these kind of things from that position. Obviously, use it only for good, not for bad. What is important is to understand that yes, stars do have a huge impact on us because they're shining their light on us. They are not our ultimate master. You are your ultimate master. And even if there's a certain position that can be malefic in your chart, you can easily change that. How do you change that? By becoming self-realized. When you realize your potential, when you realize who you truly are, when you realize that you are the master of your universe, you will be able to just transcend these planetary aspects, the stars aspects, and you will be able to just do you do whatever you like. You will see that when you become aware of the lessons that are coming your way, you will be able to develop your soul to the level that the stars will not keep giving you certain lessons. You will not feel the same way anymore because now you are aware. Awareness is the key to any success always. You will basically reach the ultimate wisdom and you will free yourself from these planetary aspects. Stars are our teachers. They will show us certain things, but ultimately you are the master of your life and you have the creator's power in your hands. And when you learn a certain lesson, the stars will lead you be. When you become enlightened, you are completely out of their power. Now, there's one more thing that I want to throw out there, but really there are millions of other things that we can talk about. This is just scratching lightly the very, very basics so that you can perhaps have a different perspective on how to read your astrology chart if you are interested in Vedic astrology and just getting a different angle of who you who you could be, what the blueprint could be, right? If you look at the planets and their degrees, there's always one planet that will have the highest degree. That planet with the highest degree is called the Atmakarka. Now, usually the, or the natural Atmakarka is the sun. And, and for the most part, I've seen many charts, sun is usually the uh, Atmakarka in many charts, but sometimes it's a different, different planet. Like for example, for me, Saturn is my Atmakarka. So the reason why is because Saturn is on uh, 25 degrees and therefore it is my Atmakarka. If I look at Albert Einstein, his Atmakarka is actually Venus, okay? And then there is something called Amatya Karka, which is the planet with the second uh, highest degree, which would be his moon at 22nd degrees. Now Atmakarka is the indicator of your soul's desire. And Rahu and Ketu are usually not considered as a possible Atmakarka because they are not real planets, but only shadows, okay? Same for, for the Amatya Karka. Uh, Amatya Karka is uh, very much connected with uh, Atmakarka. If Atmakarka is taken as the king, Amatya Karka is the advisor of the king, I think. I believe that's what they call it. Basically, uh, it would be that whichever lesson Atmakarka is bringing into your life, Amatya Karka is helping you to get through that lesson. So that is also something that you can look at. Just, you know, if you see that, for example, sun is your Atmakarka, you can just write sun as Atmakarka and you will see what kind of lessons you will have to go through, what kind of personality that will bring out of you and so on. Let's just run with Albert Einstein for a sec, okay? 
So uh, I'm going to put the chart somewhere in here so I don't have to hold it and I can just look at it and I can just tell you what I feel about that so that you have a little understanding of what we're talking about in here. So his first house is ascendental sign is um, the Gemini. This means that it's someone who is very good at communicating, okay? His Mercury is placed in the 10th house. And that means uh, that he's using communication on an everyday basis in his work field. Now, the funny thing is, <laughs> when we're talking about uh, Gemini in the first house, talking about someone who gives an impression, this is the first thing that we see, right? So if we, if we think about Albert Einstein, we think about his crazy hair, he looks like he was uh, he just touched, uh, you know, the, the electric socket, right? So that's the first impression. That's what we're talking about. Sometimes people with Gemini in their ascendental, as their ascendental, um, they have a, a little peculiar look to them. And this actually fits perfectly. Uh, his second house, he has Ketu in there. So this would mean that this person is not particularly interested in gaining wealth and he's not particularly interested in family. He is somewhat detached from that. He's not here or he wasn't here to gain material assets. He was much more interested in what lies across that, which is Rahu. Because Rahu and Ketu are always across each other, always. You know, where, where's the head? Um, just across that is the tail always so if if rahu would be here ketu would be here if rahu would be here ketu would be here always um so rahu means our obsession with something and he has rahu in the eighth house in the eighth house and that means that that's someone that is deeply immersed with science with cold with digging deeper into layers of black holes also because the represents uh, eight house represents black holes like, like emptiness basically empty space and it's also in uh, the zodiac of Capricorn in the sign of Capricorn so uh, and if you look above then you'll see that Saturn is in its own house because 10th house naturally belongs to Saturn so we're talking about someone who is very much interested in occult, in occult and scientific research, investigating basically, that he teaches for uh, living. Because in the 10th house we have Saturn, uh, Sun, Venus and Mercury. So we're talking about someone who's a very charming person publicly, talking, giving, giving lectures, speaking about things that are related to uh, that kind of deep science, um, physics, you know, astrophysics, and so on. So this is something that is actually quite interesting. Now I'll tell you one thing, which uh, is a little gossip. When you have Mars in the eighth house, it creates someone who is a very sexual person because Mars is uh, that fiery energy, that that action taken uh, constantly, and if it's in the eighth house, it creates a person uh, that is very much focused uh, on that okay so those things I can easily tell you then uh, in the uh, ninth house we see that he has Jupiter in in there that means that he, he has the guru in the house of a guru that means that he himself had a guru or that can also mean that he himself is the guru. He he is he is basically the guru for other people. But also means that this house expands. That means that this person has been traveling for um, during their life a lot, usually long distances. It's interesting because Jupiter is in its own house, in its own sign basically, because it's Sagittarius. Uh, sorry, it's um. um uh, Aquarius so this is someone who doesn't take life that seriously and who travels a lot and then we have moon in the sixth house moon is usually secrets it's our soul and so on this creates someone who is somewhat fearful someone who can have some issues also with court um, legal things and so on I also think to be honest that this creates someone um, who, 
like I actually don't know that much about Albert Einstein to be honest but um, I would think that because he has Venus in the 10th house um, which is the house of love obviously he probably was very mesmerizing to many of his female students and God knows what um, I'm just saying there's a lot lots of interesting things that you can see from the chart they don't necessarily mean that those things are true obviously but it's a, it's the potential of the planet the potential of the sign and so on um, so yeah you can you can see lots of things and you can dig deep and and just start with the position of your moon with your nakshatra start with your atma karka you can start with your ascendental sign and you will gain a lot of clarity on that then if you want to know more about your career obviously look into your 10th house if you want to know more about your relationships look into your 7th house uh, if you want to know more about your traveling look into your 9th house and so on and so forth if you want to become a writer you should have uh, activated third house also because it's a house of writing and like for example for me i have saturn in my third house which is actually uh, favorable and I, it's a retrograde also it's a favorable position for anyone who wants to be a novelist actually because those people like to write for long periods of time but usually uh, uh, what Saturn does also, it, it creates someone who's fairly strict. So it could also mean that that person doesn't necessarily have to write a novel, but they can write uh, a memoir, memoir or something that is not fictional, but is ra rather factual, okay? So all these things we can look at. It's, uh, it's exciting and it's very interesting and I hope that it helped you. That is everything that I have for you today. Thank you so much for your time. As always, you know, I honor it very much. And remember, you are a star, not a stardust. And that counts twice as much today when we were talking about the stars the whole time. Now, I hope that this introduction, very short, brief introduction into Vedic astrology has made you more excited to know more and to learn more about yourself. There is not enough asking why. We should always learn something new, something more exciting about us each day. And I hope that you will find your ascendantal sign, your nakshatra of your moon, and also your atmakaka so that you can understand at least some basics about yourself. And maybe it will match more than tropical astrology. Maybe not. Maybe you will feel that tropical astrology is more accurate for you you just have this innate feeling that that suits you more and that's who you are and that's perfectly fine you will always go with uh, what resonates with you the most right so that's fine and um yeah if you have any questions related to your vedic astrology chart or whatever do let me know down below uh if you don't want to share with us in here you can always hit me up on my personal instagram christina D. raju and that is all light and love. See you soon. Bye.